It's a Tuesday in December when I liquefy my assets. My coworker, the corporate cog, warns me I'm having some sort of crisis and I'll regret walking away like this. The man at the pawn shop says, uh, This stuff ain't worth hardly nothing to me. Um, you got anything else you hawking? After the smoke settles and my stacks of money fall to earth, I have a grand total of 25 large. 25,000 is what I'm able to drum up after a lot of toil on this earth, and I am now ready to direct it in full with 100% commitment to my new life goal, becoming a successful horse owner and jockey. Most of the people at the track say I'm nuts, that I'll be lucky to make it through half of a single year, not even one full season. Don. You're a gambler, not an owner, not a rider. Could I survive a year in my dream job or would it be the biggest failure to date? There's only one way to find out and only one man can get me started. Rascal Beaumont is a horseman. Well, actually he's a horse middleman, but one of the best there is. I inform him how I want to spend my money. I don't want to purchase a cheap horse or even a few cheap horses to hedge my bets against. I want only one horse, possibly the most expensive I can afford, but also the absolute best quality animal he's got in stock. I do not have time to develop talent. Because of my limited bankroll, I need to start earning purses almost immediately. I ask Rascal to only show me fillies, and he comes up with some of his top of the line creatures, which I begin to evaluate. The first filly Rascal has them trot out is named Beauty Creek. She costs $18,600 and some of that high cost is attributed to her 5 star rating when it comes to racing well in adverse track conditions. You could flood the track with wet cement and she'd still bring in a crown. Next up is a big beauty named Rigid Mind. She can run good at a longer 12 furlong race, but what impresses me most is her 4 and 5 star rated incline value and braking style. This means she is very strong out of the last turn and has top of the line acceleration, respectively. Last of the cream of the crop is a three year old named Eager Player. I look into her energetic eyes and see that she has a great personality, a four star temperament in fact and she's got high ratings and stamina on both turf and dirt tracks. She's got high ideals and a taste for celery stalks. After mulling over the numbers while sipping a sweet tea with Rascal, I couldn't ignore being drawn to a particularly strong finishing power and an easygoing personality. She'll do all right for you. Rascal says as I fill out a check in the amount of 17,800 bucks. I also note that the monthly cost of maintaining her will run about 400 bucks, and a good portion of that will go to the trainer I hire. Buster Hilt is a man I first met playing cards off a back alley on Beale Street. He is a horseman through and through, but due to some violations in his past, he was banned from the Horse Racing Association and thus has a hard time finding legitimate track work. He is a loud, gregarious man, and by the end of the card game in which we split the pot 60-40, I found him to be an honest and good man indeed. I had told him if I ever got into the business for real, he'd be the first I hire. After purchasing Rigid Mind, I made good on my promise. For a monthly cost of 400 bucks, Buster would house and train the filly. After taking her for a ride, he offers this advice on her pace. She's not a front runner, she's a preceding runner. You settle in with the pack and wait for her time to strike. She's got a three star guts rating. Don't be afraid to bump and grind a little bit. Buster and I lay out the January racing schedule to see what Rigid Mind is eligible to run in during the first month. The first available to her would be in the second week of the schedule, a short seven furlong race in Miami. With a paltry $1,900 purse for first place, it would be a nice way to ease into the season. If we wait till the third week, there is a similar seven furlong race, except this one run up in San Francisco. Other than that, there are a couple of higher class G3 races with $4,000 purses for the winner. I don't want to start any later and I prefer the lower stakes to get a read on her ability. So I decide to register in the flora and I board a plane and head south to Miami. It's a 
bright and sunny day in Miami when Buster and I arrive at the track. I mount the strong filly and they jam us into the gate. The moment of truth. Within seconds I'll know if I purchased an investment or a liability. I feel her shift her weight beneath me, my thighs gripping her sides. I think back on the warnings. You're a gambler, not an owner, certainly not a rider. What kind of owner rides? The gate swings open and the pack explodes across the dirt. From the crowd of thunder and whistles, I quickly slip back through the pack, remembering Hilt's words. To be honest, as a gambler, I know there's a lot to pay attention to, but when you're actually up on the horse, things are happening very fast. There's the speed of the horse, there's her stamina and how fast she's using it, trying to pay attention to my place, how many furlongs behind are we, how fast the finish line is approaching, all while maintaining her condition. To be honest, I think I'm dropping too far behind. I urge her ahead and quickly realize things aren't right. She's overly exerted early on and already running a too fast pace. I pull her back, slowing her pace, trying to revive her condition in time for a late spurt. But as we round the final turn towards the grandstand, she still shows fatigue. I have just about two furlongs to go. The pack of horses ahead of us stretch further away, blurring into the horizon. I have nearly a furlong to go, yet her condition is not blue. She's not ready for her burst, but I'm running out of time. I've got to send her, and I do. Calling on her continuously, and I feel an immediate answer. She rockets ahead forward, and I feel that feeling you have riding a plane during liftoff. She surges forward fast as the increments of space between us and the finish line close. We approach the pack with incredible speed, but it is just short of enough. Within a moment, perhaps one additional furlong and we could have been a contender. 11th place finish, nearly dead last. I had ridden her wrong, but she has immense power that I should have set free sooner. Now I know, and on the next race, she will have her true debut. After our debut loss, having finished 11th out of 12 horses, my trainer Buster and I were not devastated, but rather excited. This was due to how our filly, Rigid Mind, had finished down the stretch. I had found her to have rocket power, that if I had only triggered moments sooner, she may have closed the gap and won, leaving us celebrating. Instead, we target her second race in Washington, D.C., three weeks from now. This will give her time to properly recuperate after the taxing she endured from her debut. For the next couple weeks before heading to DC, I mainly hang around with Buster as he helps Rigid Mind recuperate and prepare for her next race. He has rented out space at a large stable which boards several other horses. All during the week I begin to notice someone else not far from Rigid Mind always coincidentally just hanging about. I recognize him from the track. I would see him early in the morning studying the horses in the field or up in the bleachers, licking his pencil and recording his secret observations in his notepad. His name is Penn Bowie and he is a horseman, one of the premier odds makers in the region. The bookman who sets the morning lines for the tracks and casinos all across the western states. So why is he hanging around our stable? And why does he seem to be rather interested in our filly? It isn't until after we board our train with rigid mind and after we arrive in DC that I would discover his motives. Shortly after arriving at the track on race day, I pick up a racing form and look at the rundown. There is my answer to Mr. Bowie's curiosity. He has set the odds for Rigid Mind as one of the favorites. But why would Mr. Bowie think a horse who debuted at the back of the pack now be a main contender in this, her second race? He was not seated atop her in the last race, so he could not have felt the surge of power that she unleashed beneath me in those final furlongs. But from his seat high in the grandstand, he may have seen her close the gap. That, and he was snooping around the stables the whole week before we left. He has one of the most trained eyes in the horse racing business, and he seems to think our filly can win. That leaves me excited, yet nervous, as I must race her properly. He set us as a favorite at almost five to one, and only placed one horse above us at four to one. Warm Moon, 
the number 10 horse, would be our primary competition for this race, according to Penn Bowie. And when I find out who owns Warm Moon, the stakes grow even higher. Before I became a racehorse owner, the closest I had gotten to Hillary Getty was when I would pass one of his cars in the parking lot of the racetrack. He would be watching his horses run from inside the exclusive owner's club, while I would head off to the grandstands. After purchasing Rigid Mind and attending my first owner's social, I first crossed paths with Hillary. I was sipping a mint julep and turned just as Mr. Getty was passing by. He removed his handkerchief scarf with such pomp and vigor that it nearly blew me off my feet. He never turned around to apologize. I found out Buster had a past with Getty when we were walking near a training barn at the track, and I showed him a printout of the morning line. He immediately crumpled it to the ground, spat on it, then said, Say! I'll go get some road apples to bury it with! To the gamblers at the tracks, Getty's well known as a man who willfully manipulates the odds with his large wagers. To the owners, he's head of the class, admired. And as Buster simply describes him, He's a toad! He's a noisy toad! And I'd sure like to stick it to him and his precious warm moon in the race later today. It's a crisp and cool sunny afternoon as they load us into the starting gate. We drew the number 12 slot, so we're all the way at the end. Warm Moon whinnies nervously two stalls over in the number 10 slot, and atop her is Getty's jockey, a man named Harper, who sneers as I glance his way. Go! The buzzer rings, the gates swing open, and I'm a moment behind as the pack jumps out just ahead of us. This time, I let her run, and she keeps a good pace just slightly behind the pack, close to where Buster wants us. As we hit the first turn, she is maintaining a nice slow pace and seems to have a good reserve of stamina. We come out of the second turn towards the grandstands, and I know I'll have to send her soon. The pack of horses is spread out evenly across the track in front of us. The sign indicating two furlongs to go whizzes past, and I begin to call on her with the whip. She speeds up, but the others are calling on their horses as well. As the one furlong sign scrolls past, I'm running out of time. I call on her faster and faster, and she responds, closing the gap on the pack ahead and trying to find a seam to cut through them. Half a furlong to go as the other horses close in around her as she surges forward. Trying to avoid being bumped, I pull her to the left and forward. It's too late. She's stuck, just behind the leaders, as the pack thunders past the finish line. A sixth place finish. And again, I feel that it was my fault. The way I rode her, she has more power under the hood and I just need to maneuver her properly to win. Sixth place, it reads, as I look up at the glowing light bulbs on the scoreboard and the grandstands. Then, a smile crosses my lips as I look at the name of the jockey and horse just below mine. In seventh place, Harper, Warm Moon. Well, I'll be if we didn't just lick Hillary Getty's prize filly. That night before we head back home, Buster and I hit the town and celebrate our small victory. Rigid Mind has finished twice as fast as her debut run, and we showed up Hillary Getty. A good omen it would seem. After the race, Buster says Rigid Mind needs to recuperate, but I want to strike while the iron's hot. After her first strong finish in only her second race, I'm more certain than ever she can get a win. After looking over the upcoming races, Buster insists she can't run sooner than two weeks from now up in San Francisco. Back at the home track, there's a lot of talk about this brash newcomer, that's me, defeating the equestrian king, Hillary Getty. Even if both our horses finished out of the top three, it still captured the peanut gallery's attention. People like my old associate, Creek Dobson. Say, Don, pretty brash what Rigid Mind did to Getty's Philly back there in DC. Creek Dobson is a horseman, a horseman and a gambler, who always seems to have one busted trifecta between himself and being rich. But since I've become an owner slash rider, I've left my gambling ways behind. And so, a good portion of the time between races, we overheard small talk and innuendo regarding whether or not Getty would enter a horse into the upcoming race in San Francisco, and whether he would have his revenge and put that young brash rider in his place. 
After boarding Rigid Mind and riding the train north, Buster and I arrive at Oakland Station. We then load up onto a ferry and kill time with a card game on the short trip across the bay to San Francisco. Arriving at the track, I begin to immediately scan the horses in their pre-race warm-up trots. One after the other strolls by, and yet I don't see the jockey Harper riding high. I look over the odds sheet, and sure enough, Getty's jockey is not listed. So, Getty chose not to race. But I'll bet my bottom dollar he's here, high above the dirt oval, secluded behind the mirrored glass of his skybox, observing my every movement atop rigid mind. It seems most fortuitous that we've drawn the number one gate slot. Not only that, but indeed Penn Bowie has set us as the flat-out favorite at almost even money. If I were still a gambling man, I would win only 40 cents on every dollar I bet on Rigid Mind. But Penn Bowie believes in our horse, which means he could see the strength in her that I could feel while in the saddle gliding down that home stretch. All the more pressure. We need to have our first win, and we need it here and now. They load us into the number one gate slot, beneath a nice thick layer of scattered clouds. I breathe in deeply and smell the thick ocean marine layer. I tighten my legs grasp and feel her quiver in anticipation. She shifts her weight. A series of snorts vibrates down the line towards the right of us. Ready? Go! Then the gate swings open. We launch from the slot in a perfect start, staying parallel to the group of runners as we glide along the white railing into the first turn. I remember Buster's advice. Her nature is to stay right behind the leaders. Keep pace, then let her loose down the home stretch. The most important thing is for me to maneuver her into a position where she can cut through the leaders when I do set her loose. But as I round the bend, we become boxed in against the rail and pushed slightly back. With a much longer race than previously, we've got a full loop to run. We settle in on the back stretch, and so far she seems to be running cool. A nice mid-pace, just where she needs to be. I call on her slightly and she responds. We accelerate through a bulk of the runners to just behind the leaders, just where we need to be. Don't be afraid to bump and grind a little bit. I remember Hilt's words as we accelerate and bump and grind our way right into third position. As the pack thunders down the home stretch, an open path lay before us. A light lather of sweat shines across Rigid Mind's back. She's good to go, and I call on her, over and over. As the final furlong speeds past us, she surges forward with confidence, splitting the remaining horses and galloping past the wire. First place. We have just won our first race, and everything is about to change. After returning back home, I can't stop reliving our first win over and over in my memory. The surge of power Rigid Mind had unleashed down the stretch, muscling our way between the thundering pack, riding the force of nature past the finish line amidst the cacophony of cheers and flurry of flowers. Back home at the barn, Buster is putting away Rigid Mind in her stall when I see it. Just outside next to a planter is a small bread box sized styrofoam cooler with a decorative envelope on top. I cautiously approach the container. I carefully peel open the thick cardboard stock envelope and remove the card, seeing a small delicate cursive inscription. My eyes dart to the bottom and the signature which reads H. Getty, the wealthy horse owner to whom Buster shares an unknown sordid past and whom I bested two races ago with my unproven filly. What could he possibly have to send to us? I hear his voice as I read the cursive inscription. Dear Rider, the Crocus Stakes race was of no significance to me, other than it was where I first spotted the name of a rider which I didn't recognize. This name, in and of itself, would carry no significance to me other than the queer fact that it manifested itself again in taking first place at the Young Horse Stakes. Any man who takes a win, no matter how green and uncultured, still deserves a tip of the cap. Cheers to you and your stable, sir. Signed, H. Getty. The note comes across both complimentary and dismissive, but I can't help but feel satisfaction when I withdraw a fancy bottle of champagne. It's at this very moment when Buster emerges from the paddock. Say, what do we got here? 1998! 
It's a good year. Yeah. I pop the cork and drip some bubbly out for us. Buster seems to savor the taste of it. Then I tell him it's a gift from H. Getty. Piss water. Buster spits his mouthful to the floor with disgust. Then he tells me, I was a trainer for Getty, one of a team of elite horsemen, eventually invited into his inner circle. But I never truly knew him. One fateful night at his private card game, I learned I do not wish to oblige him any further. Those were strong words coming from Buster. Those and piss water. Buster and I avoid an uneasy atmosphere by focusing on preparations for our next race, the Pansy Stakes in Toronto. And before I even know it, I'm loading into the starting gate. On this particular day, in this particular race, we are the 12 horse, out of 12 horses. So we're positioned all the way on the outside, and we'll be at a slight disadvantage to the inside runners. But it is a long 11 furlong race. So if Rigid Mind can maintain her endurance, we should have the time to maneuver into contention. Go! The gate buzzes open and we surge forward, galloping ahead of the pack in our best start yet. As we enter the first turn, I let Rigid Mind settle in behind the leaders, in her comfort zone. I hold her wide right of the pack, and her condition only dips slightly as she maintains her high rate of travel across the thick turf. As we rocket around the bend, my heart palpitates with excitement as I realize she hasn't even broken a sweat. Her endurance is unaffected as we pull out of the turn remarkably close with the leaders. As the pack thunders down the home stretch in a tight-knit group, we sit five horses back from the leader. There's no need to urge her on as she's running a nice slow pace while maintaining her condition. Man, this horse can run! I think back to the day I purchased this filly from the horse middleman, Rascal Beaumont. Two of her selling points Rascal pushed the hardest were her strength at long distance and her blazing acceleration out of the last turn. And sure enough, here we are, tearing out of the last turn, near the front, and her final burst waiting locked and loaded. All I have to do is pull the trigger. Two to go. But as it turns out, hoofs beating the grass down the home stretch, I can leave the riding crop holstered. On her own accord, she glides past the leaders, taking a one length lead. As we slice through the final furlong to ear piercing applause, I bring the crop down a couple times as a mere formality. Rigid mind will accept nothing less than a win. After racking up back-to-back -back wins, there is a lot of excitement to go around. Penn Bowie approaches me to exclaim, I'd like to submit an official request to visit your barn from the Handicappers Council. The man at the pawn shop called and said, So, uh, probably got some cash on hand. You wanna buy back some of your junk? Or maybe an acoustic guitar? Then, the most unusual thing occurs. Another cold pack arrives. This time, it has Champagne 1998, a Tupperware filled with what seems to be lox trimmings, and another correspondence from H. Getty. It reads, I can see you're fashioning yourself a winner, perhaps a future champion. That filly, having made my life spotting talent and thusly acquiring crowns, I thought it prudent to put forth an invitation to you. I've noticed you've registered in an upcoming race, the Crystal Stakes in Miami. Although I won't have a horse running, I see it as an opportunity to meet at my golf course in the nearby town of Emerald Swamp, as I've got some potential business opportunities to extend to you. Good day, H. Getty. What on earth could these opportunities Getty put forth to me be? Does he really see champion potential in rigid mind? When I look at the upcoming schedule, sure enough, the upcoming race is only three weeks away. Buster insists it's too soon to race. Then I tell him about the invitation from Getty and the opportunity. Go ahead, break bread with the man. But I'm warning you, and I hope you listen to me. You may find yourself at a fork in the road, and before you know it, headed straight down a dark path with no breadcrumbs to boot. 
After touching down near sun-splashed Gulfstream Park, Buster heads to the training facility for warm-ups while I head out to tee off with Hillary. I have to admit, I feel a bit nervous about playing Getty on the course he built and owns, but he immediately puts me at ease, assuring me he's an awful golfer, even on his own course. He used to lose so many balls in the drink, he tells me, that he had to remove all the water hazards on the course. Wasn't that difficult to do, I ask him? Why, it's no more complex than taking a straw and sipping up a puddle of Chateau Neuf de Pap from a countertop. He says, Before you know it, I realize we've played a few holes and haven't even discussed anything to do with horses. And when the subject is breached as we stroll across the sixth fairway, it's because of a story he tells me regarding a six-figure bidding war he engaged in against a sultan over a colt that never ended up running a single race. Then wouldn't you know it, I had a short pitch overshoot the green into some tall grass, and I lost my ball. It's the darndest thing, but I don't see it anywhere. Getty shrugs it off and insists I use one of his extra golf balls, which I am grateful for. But when he withdraws it from his bag and presents it to me, it's the most gaudy and garish bauble I've ever struck. But I accept the kind gesture, and end up getting a birdie and saving the next couple pars. Getty then spends a good deal of time talking up his estate back home, up the coast from Malibu. The fresh air, he tells me, his private stables, he tells me. He insists I come visit when the time is right. Then, before you know it, we finish the course. Getty has to leave for a business meeting and wishes me luck at the race as he won't be able to attend. How odd, I think, as I make my way from the course, that Getty didn't present an offer or a deal or a fork in the road with one dark passage, as Buster had warned? Could it be that somehow Getty was interested in a friendship? After taking a cab through blazing hot Miami traffic, I arrive at the track, making haste to the jockey quarters. At the Miami race during morning workouts, I pass by Penn Bowie and he is wearing dark shades and a poker face. What did he observe that made him have this skeptical countenance? I'm still mulling it over as I mount rigid mind and they load us into the starting gate. Then I start thinking about the race ahead. It's funny, I was so preoccupied with Getty's golfing excursion that I hardly paid much mind to the details of the race itself. I think back on the schedule forms I went over with Buster. This is a shorter, seven furlong race, so I'll have to keep Rigid Mind tight with the pack since we won't have as much time to pull off her powerful home stretch surge. It's also a higher class grade three race, which means it will be a more competitive group of runners. And sure enough, Penn Bowie has placed us as not the odds on favorite, but somewhere in the middle at nearly nine to one. Could this explain Penn Bowie's chilly demeanor? I don't have time to consider it further as the gate swings open and we're off to the races. We launch forward at the front of the group and I carefully ease her into position behind the leaders. The only problem is, everyone seems to want to be a front runner. And as I thunder into the first turn, nearly the whole pack of runners are ahead of us. As we round the turn and come out of the bend, we're on a too fast a pace but I have little I can do as the field is blazing a trail to the finish line. We drift further behind. At two furlongs to go, I call on her and she accelerates us back into the running. With one furlong to go, I pull the trigger, calling on her to make our move, and she responds, rocketing ahead towards the leaders and nearly crashing right into them from behind. It's all jammed up with no space to squeeze through. I pull her inside and to the left, searching for daylight. We'll need to bump and grind our way through, and we need to do it fast as the finish line is screaming towards us. Trying to push our way through, and we just can't force it. We're stuck in the pack, crossing the finish post, out of contention. I ease up on the reins and relax my posture and muscles, which had solidified into tense concrete. Looking up towards the digital readout high above the grandstands, I see what I already know. Our winning streak? has come to an end. Later that evening, I'm licking my wounds at the small arcade in my hotel off the turnpike when I receive a call from none other than H. Getty. Over the phone, Hillary offers me condolences and his veteran's advice. 
take my advice, brush it off, and run her again! He then goes on to encourage me to enter the upcoming Freesia Stakes in Washington, D.C. He'll be running a promising filly of his own, he tells me, and he could use some sporting competition. He then goes on to invite me to his compound and estate, which I heard so much about on the links. And to tell you the truth, after the short, exhausting, and ultimately disappointing finish at the Miami Crystal Stakes, I could use a small getaway. Visiting Hillary's compound is not the vacation I was expecting. At least, getting there isn't. I assumed I would be arriving by private car at most, but Getty himself flew me in, piloting his jet black chopper over raging mountain rivers and thick pine forests before landing us with some uncertainty on the tarmac of his private airfield. After a short drive, he shows off the grounds of his beautifully manicured private residence his sprawling network of horse stables, and finally we retire to a lush courtyard where we are seated before a glistening waterfall and brought a tasty spread of olives, cheese, and peppercorns. Between sipping down sweet bubbly from his vineyards and crunching down the dark pungent kernels of peppercorn, I breach the possibly taboo subject of Buster Hilt. I ask Eddie his perspective on what went wrong between him and the horsemen and how a simple game of cards could sour their relationship. As Getty sums it up, it went like this. Some men wager small and never win. Some wager big and always lose. But it is the man who backs out from a wager altogether whom I simply cannot respect. After that, our conversation drifts to horse trainers in general, and Getty warns me they can often drain your purses with fees from excessive training session, and he reminds me to not overthink the process. He then relays a series of wild tales boasting about his past wins in the unregulated racing circuits of Central America where he cut his teeth on the thoroughbred game. Then, at long last, after the final drop of bubbly drips from the bottle and my belly churns with cheddar and pepper, our visit comes full circle. He asks if I know why he never laments a loss, to which I say no. Then he says, When it comes down to it, I'm not in the horse racing business at all. No, but you are. And unlike me, you can't afford to have a losing streak. So you need an edge over the competition. A magic formula. You need bloodstock. He goes on to tell me that the surest way to have a long career in this game is to always be investing in the future winners. And to have future winners, one needs winning pedigrees. And he's got dozens of stalls in his stables filled with proven winners. And for a fee, or as he calls it, a stud fee. He'll allow me the privilege of breeding my filly, Rigid Mind, with the bloodstock of one of his proven champions, and thusly breeding a future winner of my own, based on the superior equine genes he's got on offer. How much would this stud fee cost me, I ask, with my stomach turning in on itself? We can work out the details, I assure you. I have a bloodstock option for nearly every budget. And here it is, the fanciest pitch I'd ever had the longest wind-up and the slickest sales presentation. I had been wined and dined for timeshares in Laughlin and Carson City, but nothing like this. And when I do ask for the details, it turns out that even his cheapest stud fee would be more than I've socked away after a life of toil. Was this his goal all along? After my filly beat his, he wanted to make a show of his money and power humiliating me and reducing me to my insignificant standing in the sport, a shadow to his great icon. Or was it just an elaborate sales pitch to make a buck off me and my racing hopes? Either way, I feel burned by all this, and it isn't just the ulcer-inducing peppercorns in my gut. I think to myself, I will not breed my precious rigid mind with one of Getty's hooved Casanovas, but I will enter the upcoming race in DC against Getty's Philly and it won't be a sporting competition at all. It will be a grudge match. And all I want to do, as Buster so eloquently put it, is stick it to Hillary Getty at that race. Upon returning to the barn, I order Buster to prepare for a trip back east for the Freesia Stakes. 
I then show Buster the Bloodstock catalog. Buster shakes his head no. He says I'm racing for a personal vendetta, a Bloodstock feud, and not for the horse or the crown. Buster dismissing me with his veteran's cadence drives me nuts, and I start to believe no one thinks I can best Getty. This is when I pay a visit to my old gambling compatriot, Creek Dobson, who is now no longer going by his God-given name of Dobson. After hitting several high-dollar exactas and a box trifecta, he's now referred to around the track as Fortuitous Creek. He has the cool confidence of a horseman on a winning streak. You see, shortly after Rigid Mind took her first win, he took notice of her and got what gamblers refer to as an inkling. He had a hunch. So, he followed up on it by doing some not-so-above-board research. Namely, rooting through the trash of expert bookman Penn Bowie. What he discovered was that Penn believed in my filly, and so, Dobson started betting big on us. And with our winning streak, he reaped a windfall the biggest of his life. So, I put it to Dobson straight. Does he think Rigid Mind has a shot in the upcoming race against Getty's Philly? Dobson tells me according to the information he's gathered, Penn Bowie thinks we're running Rigid Mind a bit hard, but he also is planning on putting us at the top of the odds with one or two other horses. This is quite satisfying to me as I realize the master handicapper thinks we have a shot. We arrive in DC and I imagine a brief, somewhat icy exchange with Getty where I return his catalog informing him I have no intention of breeding my filly at his farm. But upon arriving at the track, there is no such incident. In fact, the only sign I see of H. Getty is when I glance upwards towards the skybox, above the grandstands, and I spot his imposing form. The time has come for the title bout, and I sip on a crystal Pepsi dowsing the butterflies in my stomach with a sparkling, rejuvenating rain. When the odds sheet comes up, I see how Mr. Penn Bowie has placed us. Sure enough, from a field of 12, Bowie has predicted three horses as likely winners of this, the Freesia Stakes. The number two horse, Pale Wind, owned by a formaldehyde tycoon from Sedona. The number three horse, Kinky Angel, owned by none other than the Equestrian King and my greatest rival to date, Hilary Getty. And the number six horse, my precious rigid mind. Bowie has set the three of us at nearly three to one odds to win, with a slight favorability going towards Getty's Kinky Angel. They load us into the gate under a gray, overcast sky, the clouds bloated with moisture, ready to burst. I take a long, deep breath to try to ease my nerves. I don't want rigid mind to feel my anxious vibrations. But I can't help thinking about the fact that this is a grade two race, the most competitive field I've ever run against. But it's also a 10 furlong race. That seems to be the sweet spot for rigid mind giving her enough time to settle in and make her final burst, if I can maneuver her properly. The buzzer rings and the gates spring open. The pack of horses surges forward in a furious stampede. I allow Rigid Mind to find her pace. She settles in a few lengths behind the group as we swing through the first turn. As we cruise into the back stretch, most of the horses compress inwards towards the railing. Remembering how we became pocketed in and ultimately trapped in a group of runners in our last race, I carefully position her behind the group and just to the right. If I can stay in this position, she will need the mightiest of surges to win at the end, but she'll have a clear shot. As we pass the halfway fifth furlong marker, it seems we're running a too fast pace. But there's not much I can do as we remain behind all of the runners and not gaining much ground. We blaze into the final turn, several lengths behind the pack. The rush of wind is needling into my face. I grit my teeth together and part my lips, taking a slow, deep breath through the space between teeth. You're gonna lose. A flash of negative thought blinks in my brain. Trust the process, I tell myself. Believe in her now, I tell myself, leaning my body forward and pushing against the rock-hard, undulating muscles beneath me. As the pack thunders out of the turn into the home stretch, they begin to fan apart. And just like that, my strategy for racing past them on the right side has vanished. All daylight has disappeared as there's no clear path to accelerate through. 
but we're running out of time. Only two furlongs to go. Time's up and I call on her. Responding, as always, she closes the gap and we shift towards the inside of the pack. Again, we're becoming boxed in and I feel a wave of panic at the edge of my psyche. A massive churning tidal wave of doubt is crashing just behind her back heels. We must outrun it, girl. I shout into her ear, vamos, vamos mi amor. I shout into the blowing wind, one furlong to go and we move up into the center of the pocket of runners, the eye of the storm. It's anyone's race, but it won't be ours unless we can break on through. Half a furlong, seconds left, my thighs squeeze tight. We push forward, shooting a gap like greased lightning. The finish post, there's a horse to our right and it's over. A shot fires into the air. The finish line was crossed in a blur of fur and flesh and flash bulbs. But did we win? I can't be sure. I slow rigid mine to a trot and look up towards the raucous grandstands. Everyone shares their opinion of which snout crossed the line first. Somewhere in a dark replay room, track officials watch the slow motion replay to determine the winner of the photo finish. I take another deep breath smiling and patting rigid mind on the side of her neck. I watched the digital readout on the board high above the grandstands, waiting for it to display the official results. My chest aches with anticipation. Those butterflies that were in my stomach before the race have now flown to my breast, and they are packed tightly in a thick cluster on the veiny branches of my heart. I look to the private spectator booths at the top of the grandstands. The silhouetted form of H. Getty is standing still as a statue, anticipating the final results from the tight pack of horses that blew past the finish line in the same second of time. Then, the light bulbs on the board buzz aglow. The butterflies flutter from my heart and take flight, releasing an explosion of jubilation and relief through my body and brain. We have won. Rigid mind has won. And I look up to the skybox, and it's empty. After winning the race, Conquering Getty for a second time and taking three out of our last four races by storm, I feel an overwhelming rush of excitement and power. Like nothing can touch me. I'm unbreakable. And I'm about to find out just how wrong I am. Hilary Getty, the wealthy horse owner and bloodstock vendor to the stars, had toyed with me. He had felt burned by our week two win in DC, and so he wanted to show me up by proving how truly small I am in this business. Whining and dining me at his golf clubs and private estate before lining up an elaborate sales pitch in which one romp for Rigid Mind and his stables would cost more than we've got left in cash for the rest of the season. But we beat him again, where it truly counts the most, on the track. Buster said watching Rigid Mind run was like seeing wildfire tear through a dry cornfield on a windswept afternoon. Hell's bells, Ryder! I felt like a foolish kid again! So in that sense, I felt we had bested Getty, and I could close that chapter. After a series of events like that, you'd think Buster and I would paint the town three shades of purple and celebrate in revelry. But instead, I become ill with fever. I am sick, sweating buckets and bedridden with aches and pains. Buster calls me from the stables and suggests we shut the whole thing down for a couple of months so that Rigid Mind and myself can both rest and recuperate. But against Buster's judgment, the Rigid Mind inside my own skull only sees our bank account, and its balance is less than half what we started with. When the season started, I hawked all my material possessions to the guy at the pawn shop to earn the money to take a shot at my dreams. Now I can't stop thinking about Getty's warning about training sessions slowly draining your bankroll. And after winning a series of small change races, we finally secured our first graded win. And with that, the substantial prize purse of 5,200 bucks. I'd like to keep the greenbacks blowing our way. So even though I'm sick as a dog, I mutter to Buster, I'll be ready to ride. And then I instruct him to get Rigid Mind registered in the soonest available race, the Hong Kong Stakes. Then I let my aching head fall onto the pillow and I slip into a deep slumber. My unconscious thoughts are overtaken and occupied with dark feelings, thunderous ambience, and a crawling anxiety. Emerging from the abyss is the vision of a man 
whose identity is completely foreign to me, yet his presence gives me an unexplained sense of familiarity. Not comfort, just an unknown link which I feel powerless to break. His hand fan beats away at the air in tiny bursts with a haunting rhythm. His eyes stare, no they glare directly into me as if shouting a question in a silent language which I'm unable to translate. Then slowly he dissolves from my unconscious dream and I drift peacefully over water and slowly into the quiet darkness of a cave. Show me thine bustin' trifecta. I jolt awake, placing my hand on my bedside golf bag for comfort. As the race draws near, my headache migrates to my belly, and to call it a bowel-twisting stomach bug would be kind. For this reason, I opt to travel with rigid mind by train so I can lie down like a tramp in the boxcar and get some rest during the journey. But every time I slip into slumber, the phantom with the hand fan appears, tormenting me with a silent fluttering rhythm. You can imagine my surprise when I wake up and disembark in New Orleans for the Hong Kong Stakes. But it was apparently the soonest race Buster could get us signed off on, as I instructed him to do. At the track, Buster and I share little more than professional courtesies, as I can tell he's getting road-worn and weary. But before I know it, I've saddled up high atop Rigid Mind, and they load us into the starting gate stalls. I'm feeling lightheaded with fever and trying my best to stay upright in the saddle so that the starter doesn't become suspect to my condition and scratch us from the race. Rigid Mind flicks her ears nervously. I can feel droplets of sweat run from beneath the hard shell of my racing cap, down through the tangle of my sideburns and dripping off my chin. I glance down to see where the droplets are falling, just then noticing my left foot is hanging loose out of the stirrup. Then the buzzer goes off and the gate opens. Rigid mind lunges and we're jerked back into place, the stirrup stuck on a bolt in the gate. I kick down, knocking it loose, and we tear off from the starting line, a good clip back on the pack. As we rumble forward, the dizzy spell sets over me like a thick blanket. I lean forward, closing my eyes and holding on to rigid mind, not guiding her, but clinging to her massive undulating form for my own safety. As I feel us enter the first turn, we are still far off the leader. But as we come out of the turn, the one consolation is that we're running a nice slow pace, and her burst should be ready when I call upon her. Sweat stings my eyes and I close them again. Come on, girl, I whisper against the cutting wind. But when I open them, a flash. There he is again, the phantom, dominating my vision, occupying my mind. A whiff of doubt breezes over my mind with every sway of his fan. As we turn into the home stretch, the pack of horses far ahead of us, I close my eyes, calling on her again and again while hoping for a miracle. She responds, accelerating forward, galloping with a mighty force towards the pack ahead. The final furlongs flashing past in a blur of stinging sweat and hallucinatory flash frames. But it's not enough. The horses cross the finish line all together, followed by us in dead last. After our massive defeat, Penn Bowie, the handicapper who was so beguiled by Rigid Mind, now seems bemused. And nearly everyone has an opinion on our turn in fortunes. As gambling vanguard Fortuitous Creek chimes in, It's not the horse! It's the rider! He's got the yips. And a bad case of them to boot. Well, I don't believe I do have the yips. And I know there is one place where I can prove that to silence Bowie, to silence Creek, and perhaps most importantly, to silence the haunting phantom which torments my soul. We'll travel to the center of the thoroughbred racing universe, Lexington, Kentucky, at the prestigious grade three Lexington handicap. That's where we'll redeem our reputation and earn a purse hefty enough to get us on track for the remainder of the season. When I inform Buster of my decision, he just shakes his head in disapproval. But he's not the one with a finite bankroll and on the verge of losing his dreams. And with each passing week I spend money on Buster's training regimen, I sink further towards a future on Skid Row. We need a big win and we need it now. And so, we're Kentucky bound. 
Race day is a hot dirt track beneath a Kentucky blue sky filled with Kentucky puffed clouds. The gate bursts open and we jolt forward with the pack. As the horses surge forward, I gently ease us back, just behind the group, trying to replicate the racing style that has brought us so much success in the earlier part of the season. As we round the first bend, just a few lengths off the leaders, her endurance is holding strong, and we seem to be in a good position with the group ahead. But as the race goes on, my mind again becomes clouded with the interfering image of the Phantom. With each stroke of his decorative hand fan, I feel a tidal wave of air pushing against us, keeping us from proceeding forward with the runners. Could the doubts that Creek cast be true? Is this what the yips feel like? And am I, in fact, afflicted with said yips? I may have that answer sooner than I'd like, as we come out of the last turn the same way we entered the first one, in last place, with hardly any daylight ahead. With only two furlongs to go, I call on Rigid Mind, and she answers, surging ahead, but to what end? A solid wall of glossy, muscled flesh blocks our path. I pull her inside, towards the rail, searching for a crevice to bump and grind through, but there is none. As the final furlong crawls past in slow motion, I feel my grip on the harness loosen, then release. I fall from the saddle, as we fall from contention, in nearly last place. I'm carried from the track into the jockey's quarters and tossed on a bale of hay near Rigid Mind's stall. I don't know if it's the bootleg painkillers they've administered or my own madness that took over my mind, but all I could see was the phantom and the misfortune and Getty's booming voice repeating over and over. Brush it off and run her again! Run her again! Run her again! I mumble over and over to Buster that we have to run Rigid Mind. We have to run her again until finally Buster puts it to me plainly. The horse can't run! And I pass into slumber. When I awaken, there aren't any gamblers, no handicappers, no bug boys or saddle sallies. Just me and Rigid Mind, alone in the stall. Buster is gone. Just gone, baby, gone. What Buster always knew as the experienced horse trainer he is, and what I never listened to as the novice jockey I am, is the simple fact that my filly, Rigid Mind, has a limited number of runs in her. Perhaps it was a detail the horse middleman Rascal Beaumont had stated when he sold her to me, and I just failed to pay heed. But the fact is that with each passing race, Rigid Mind was spending her credits, and now, looking back on it, there were a dozen warnings from Buster that we need to pace her over the course of the season and carefully pick where and when we'd strike. But I had been blinded by our early success and manipulated by Hillary Getty into entering a fool's rivalry, where by winning a series of battles which in the moment felt monumental, I had actually lost the war. As rigid mind was spent for the season, and as Buster so eloquently put it, the horse can't Run! And now Buster has left the barn, refusing to train for a stubborn fool like me, and he's disappeared into some unknown corner of the globe. So here I was, alone with a filly that had been run lame, and a bit over 13 G's left in my pocket, less than half of what I started with. With a third of the racing season left to run, what could I do? I need good luck and a young colt to salvage my dream and there's one man who can get me what I need. Rascal Beaumont is the finest horse middleman this side of the Great Divide, and I'll need his expertise to pull off a miracle. You see, the last time I visited Rascal, I had a thick bankroll and the luxury of demanding only his finest stock. This time, I'm relegated to the run of the mills, but I'm not complaining. You see, the great thing about buying a racehorse is money spent does not guarantee performance. It is not unheard of that a cheap, overlooked colt that only costs a pittance evolves into a great champion, dashing all expectations. With my limited bankroll, I'll be limited in what I can afford, so I'll need Rascal to shine for me today, and my confidence swells in him as he exclaims, Well, I'll trot out what I've got in your price range. We'll go from there. With that, Rascal trots out all I can afford, a parade of one lone colt. 
Not much of a selection, so it'll be easy to choose, Rascal assures me. Frugal Power is the horse's moniker, and Beaumont says it's apt. You won't get much from him till the end of the race, and when he does give it to you, it'll be less than ample, he advises me. This is the best I can hope for, as Frugal Power's running style is most similar to Rigid Minds, which I'll have to rely on since the Colt won't have the benefit of Buster's training regimen. But even with his less than stellar assessment from Rascal, the Colt will still cost me over 10 grand putting me down to my last pennies for the remainder of the season. All of my apples will now be in one lone basket named Frugal Power. We retire to Rascal's side yard to complete the paperwork over several glasses of sweet tea. After completing the purchase and then slugging down yet another 32 ounces at Rascal's insistence, I decide to ask him a very important question before I leave. You see, when I had asked my trainer, Buster, to reveal his dark past with equestrian king Hillary Getty, he stated that he used to be a trainer for Getty, one member in a group of elite horsemen. Within that group, Buster mentioned the name of Rascal Beaumont. And so, beneath the gently swaying strands of his willow tree, and before the smoothly dancing strings of his locks, I put the question to Rascal. What did he know about the events of that fateful card game which fractured their alliance and poisoned reconciliation? Rascal smiles, takes a long, measured pull on his sweet tea, then states, Friend, it was a long time ago in the world away, Right now, I just try to mind my own business, sip on some sweet tea. I might suggest you do the same. To my surprise, I am actually able to get some decent sleep for the first time in a while, with the Phantom failing to show up for his night terror routine. I arrive in Boston on a mostly sunny day with my new cult, Frugal Power. Without having the familiar company of Buster by my side, I'm not able to do our usual game planning on the way to the track. And so, when the gate blows open and Frugal Power bolts across the fresh turf, I have the sense that I'm taking a new car on a test drive during the Daytona 500. Following the only instincts I have, I let Frugal Power settle into his pace just behind the leaders. And as we cruise into the turn, we maintain our speed in the middle of the pack. Is this the proper strategy, I wonder? Who knows? I can evaluate the horse from a gambler's perspective, but haven't developed the skill to judge the creature with a trainer's eye. And so I'm left hoping this locomotive of muscle has a similar late race burst of speed in him, much like Rigid Mind had. As we rumble down the back stretch, Frugal Power seems to have staying power as he maintains his position right in the middle, all while seeming to run a slow pace. We enter the final turn and I feel a bump on our left, then a bump on our right side. We're bounced back and forth between horses, the phantom jockey flashing through my mind with each rattling blow. As we come out of the turn into the home stretch, we've all but lost our place in the pack. It seems I've just learned the hard way that frugal power has bump, but no grind. That and his condition seems to be shot to hell. Apparently the curse of the phantom jockey is here to stay. Nevertheless, the finish line bears down on us like a bullet train, so I call on him with all I've got. To my surprise, he responds. We race forward, the leaders are just ahead of us, but we are too late, crossing the finish line, leaving a trail of exploded blades of grass in our wake. As I look to the photo finish replay, I see a line of horses all cross in the same moment, and after the judges sort things out, we're given sixth place. It had felt like we were in contention until they put it that way. It isn't long after I lose the race, I'm pacing near some loading barns when everything starts to hit me at once. Buster, my friend, the only one I could trust and the only one who was Cracker Jack at training horses, had left, leaving nary a trail to his quantum of solace. I've only got a little bit of money to scrape by for the rest of the season, and before you know it, I'm making a decision. There's no way I'm training up this colt on my own, especially with the phantom haunting me. So until I can find Buster or lift this curse, I've got to start hedging my bets. As a horse owner, I can't just mosey into the bowels of the grandstands, meld with the dregs, and start placing wagers. I can't kick rocks with the gamblers and not expect to get tarred with the same stick. And the last thing I'd need is Penn Bowie collecting data to put me up on corruption charges. 
So I arrange to meet Fortuitous Creek near some fanciful topiary, and I tell him I need him to place some wagers on my behalf. Nice to have you back in the game, my man! What do you say you and me go in on some 10 cent pick sixes, you young skunk? Creek exclaims with excitement. I then set out a series of wagers in conjunction with Creek, but also of my own accord. I bet for and I bet against myself in the next race I'll run in. And so, if I can manage to win, I'll double up on my profits. That way, if you lose, you can still afford a can of tuna. Fortuitous Creek reassures me. I arrive in the Bay Area for the grade two stakes with visions of a prize far greater than a can of sour tuna. I seek a whole trophy, packed to the gills and overflowing with savory tuna. Since this is a turf race, like our last race, and eight furlongs in length, only a furlong quicker than our last race, my game plan is to hold steady with the pack, then activate his burst of speed immediately out of the final turn to snatch our win. But when they pack us into the starting gates, the sky cracks open with thunder, releasing icy cold needles of water. I look up to the storm-ridden sky and see the phantom specter hiding in the clouds. Before I can take a deep breath, the gates ring open and frugal power tears across the wet turf. Dozens of hooves mush and splatter across the soggy grass and I can feel frugal power lose footing intermittently as we trample along. The high level of competition is clear in this grade two race as most of the pack slowly idles past us, leaving us in last place by the time we enter the turn. I close my eyes to avoid the stinging droplets, but the phantom jockey appears in the darkness, forcing me to open my lids through the watery cascade. Trying to maneuver into a favorable position, we struggle around the turn, trailing the pack and my game plan sinks into a watery grave as we exit the turn running a too fast pace, yet hardly keeping up with the other racers. I see the two furlong markers speed past my stinging vision and I lean forward into the sharp downpour, facing the haunting specter. I call on the colt to release his reserves and he responds, accelerating fast towards the group. I lean left and he cuts inside, passing horses and bearing down on the leader of the pack. I call out to him through the knives of watery spray, and he's swapping frugality for generosity as he speeds faster and faster, but it's not enough. Again, it's not enough. As we slow to a trot, I close my eyes again, and the phantom has disappeared. He's left me behind, with a sopping wet colt and a soggy spirit to boot. After trotting him into the sheds, I pat him on the neck and reassure him, we'll get him next time. And then lo and behold, as it turns out, Creek was right. With the small pittance from our winning wagers, we can still afford a couple cans of tuna. And so, as the sun sets, we retire to an alley behind the track and celebrate our small victory. It is at this most unexpected moment when a powerful revelation is made. I offhandedly remark that if the colt could see the phantom I saw during the races, then it'd scare him right into contention. Creek is immediately startled and asks how long I've been seeing the specter. Well, I guess it must have been since I, since I lost to Getty. I say, that's it, Creek exclaims. He now knows why I'm on a losing streak. I've been cursed by Getty's ghost, the phantom jockey. He then goes on to tell me the strange tale of a man named Hampton Motley, a horseman. A horseman and the wealthy heir to a grout tycoon and one of the finest riders he had ever seen. Hampton was hired by Hilary Getty to be part of an elite group of horsemen and ride exclusively for him. Together they won many races. Then, one fateful evening during a card game, the stakes rose high, then to unreasonable heights. They circled each other, horns locked together like territorial mountain goats. When the cards dropped and the chips ran dry, Getty had won, a most valuable of pots. You see, Creek explains to me, that in order for Motley to keep up with Getty's bankroll, he had to wager the last and most valuable thing he possessed, his living soul. And so, when Getty unfurled his fateful four kings to Motley's four queens, the room grew quiet and most left in disgust before the debt was collected. So, uh, how was the debt collected? I ask. So the way I heard it, Getty conducted some sort of dark ritual with his buddy, the Oracle, who's a soul mage who lives up the coast. They separated the soul from the body. 
The soul was taken with the oracle to a cave near the shoreline on the northern coast, and the body, without a soul, simply wandered away to a motel near the Del Mar racetrack. It is said that Getty wields power over the oracle, and when he bids it, the oracle sends out the phantom jockey to carry out Getty's dark deeds. I'm betting Getty wasn't too keen on you beating him twice, so he summoned his dark minion upon you. But how could he have cast it upon me? Could he have tainted peppercorns with dark energy, I ask, while growing increasingly paranoid? Not peppercorns, but a totem of some sort. It works like voodoo. It'd have to be placed on an object that you keep near you. Now think back right now. Is there any time Getty ever gave you a gift? Foot pillow? Potpourri turtle? Anything. Anything you'd keep on you in your most personal space. And with that, the previously nebulous web came into sharp focus. Over this seemingly innocent can of tuna and banter between gamblers, all the dots became connected in my mind simultaneously. And I knew there was only one thing for me to do. Later that evening, I set out on Highway 1, northbound along the coast. Little did I know that 30 miles south, in a backyard in Arcadia, my compatriot and fellow gambler, Fortuitous Creek, was about to gain an edge for the last time. Word had gotten back to me through the grapevine that Buster, my estranged trainer, had returned to the back alleys of Beale Street, where I had first met him over a game of cards. I briefly considered heading east to track him down so I could apologize for ignoring his advice on our Philly rigid mind. The advice that, had I listened to, she still may be running us to easy money this very day. The sweet girl. She was the one who had put in her heart and soul, lifting my soul to heights I hadn't imagined possible to experience. But with our glorious winning streak in the distance of our rearview mirror, I'm left to simply enjoy the company and good grace of the sweet beast. There will be no pressure to win for her until next racing season. She can relax for now and enjoy a celery stalk and consider the universe. I thought back on my first season and realized, even though I was in a slump, I did in fact have a remarkable run. No, I couldn't track down Buster just yet. Instead, I send a letter to Memphis and ask one of my contacts there to pass it around the back alley card games until it finds its way to Buster. As the season is about to close and I have just one last race to run, this will be my final chance to salvage some winnings. And so I enroll our Colt in his last race of the season. With Fortuitous Creek inexplicably missing, I'm not able to place a covert wager, but perhaps it's for the best. I had given up my career to take up owning racehorses for the chance to ride my way down the road to prosperity, and this race would be my last pure attempt at that. But first I had to set things straight. If I was going to have a shot at it in the saddle, I would have to have a clear and satisfied mind. So in the small amount of time left before the race, I headed to the beach. Mistaking me for a door-to-door -door salesman of some sort, which apparently he's very fond of, the Oracle is far more welcoming than I had expected. He offers me a Capri Sun and immediately asks to see some of my products. Well, have at it! Let's take a look at your worldly wares and exotic tchotchkes, hmm? After the disappointing discovery that I am not a salesman, he's caught off guard with the revelation of my true intentions. I have something for you, I say, handing him the gaudy bauble. The same golf ball that Getty had handed me when I lost my own while playing with him in his emerald swamp. 
the totem which carried the curse of the phantom jockey which Getty had ordered the oracle to concoct, perhaps in this very seaside cave we now sit. The phantom jockey who tormented my psyche on the racetrack and played no small part in the devastating losing streak I now find myself entangled in. I want you to remove the soul of Hampton Motley from this golf ball and return it to his body. I order him. You hold no authority over me, he says, casting a crooked pointed finger at me, which is a true statement. Hillary Getty is his boss, but I know his vice. When Creek told me about the Oracle, he explained him as a horseman, a horseman and a seventh dimensional soul mage. So I start telling him about the track and one race in particular that's coming up and that I, in fact, have some inside info on said race. After all, I'm an owner and rider with a filly set to run in it. With each word that spills from my mouth, the Oracle's gambling appetite becomes wet with excitement, and shortly, he's salivating at my proposition. I don't get out as much as I'd like to, being bound to this cave as I am by Getty's magical tether. I would relish the opportunity to Perhaps have you place a few small wagers on my behalf. I agree to place a bet on a high dollar trifecta wager in exchange for the release of Getty's curse. With that, the Oracle performs a small ritual in which he extracts the phantom jockey from the golf ball and imbues a betting slip with the trapped soul. He hands me the slip while laying out the final terms. Here is my betting slip, imbued with the soul of your friend. Upon this trifecta of horses winning, I am to turn in his betting slip in exchange for the winnings, and the curse will be lifted when the betting slip is destroyed. Upon agreeing to the terms, he bids me adieu. Break a leg! <laughs> It's clear skies in Atlantic City with a fresh sea breeze pushing the smell of salt water and fried oysters across the racetrack. As they load us into our starting slots, I inhale deeply and let a smile spread wide. We've drawn the number one slot and will have a slight positional advantage if we can keep a fast pace. Ready? The buzzer pops and the pack explodes, tearing up the track hooves and thunder. The pack quickly surges ahead of us, yet I maintain our position against the rail, just letting frugal power run his natural pace. There's a lot of open real estate ahead of us, and it should be a green light to gain some ground, but something is holding us back. I feel a heavy weight, the sensation of a lead sandbag resting in my hip pocket and growing heavier and heavier with every stride. Frugal Power seems to sense the handicapped sensation as well, as I can feel him heaving with great power, yet we gain little ground on the pack ahead. The weighted sensation emanates from my right hip pocket, the very location which holds the Oracle's betting slip, now imbued with the cursed soul of the Phantom Jockey, and the Phantom is working hard again at ensuring we lose this race. For by us placing outside of the top three finishers, the Oracle will likely hit his precious trifecta bet and will win. I can envision him now, in his seaside lair, watching with intent through some magical portal and riding the fantastic emotional roller coaster every gambler is on when their horses seem to be lining up for a win. Having glanced at his betting slip prior to the race, I saw the trifecta of horses he picked to win, and peering ahead now through the piercing wind, I see they are in fact amongst the leaders of the pack. The furlongs are drifting by, and if I'll have a chance to bust the Oracle's trifecta, we'll have to make our move now. With the final furlong slipping past, I call on Frugal Power for all he's got, and to my surprise, he surges. Keeping him close on the inside, we race ahead, gaining ground, moving halfway through the pack of racers, leaning inside, hoping to find a window of light to dart through, but there is none. The finish line whizzes past, and I know we finished outside the top three. Even so, I feel so dang proud of the strong colt carrying me. Frugal Power made a heroic effort with little to no training, and I'm grateful to him for that. 
When I look up to the board above the grandstands, it confirms what I already know. The Oracle hit his trifecta. After losing, I pack up frugal power and leave the racetrack, passing right by the betting windows. I'm not ready to cash in the slip yet. For when I cash in the slip and deliver the money to the Oracle's cave, it will release the soul of the jockey back to his master, where he'll surely be assigned to haunt the next wayward rider who crosses Getty and denies his stud fee shakedown. Sure, I'd be free to ride again, but there is something that just doesn't sit right with the whole bargain. About a week after the race, I'm cleaning up some tack, prepping to put Rigid Mind on her winter vacation, when Buster shows up with the letter. I apologize for my foolishness from the bottom of my heart, and to my relief, we're able to bury the hatchet beneath a tranquil and deep stream of water under the bridge. We break bread and I catch him up on my misadventures, buying frugal power and succumbing to Getty's ghost, discovering Buster's sordid past with Getty and trying to strike a deal with the Oracle to set it all straight. Finally, struggling to win but falling just short. I then show him the betting slip I had yet to cash in and we share a chuckle thinking about how raw the Oracle must be since I have yet to show up with her payment. Buster then shares with me his own remorse at never being able to set the events right from the card game that went so wrong that fateful night. Then, with a twinkle in his eye, he suggests there's more than one way to shoe a horse. He then lays out his plan. When I hear the details, I'm caught off guard with his requests, as it would involve me committing damn near the gravest mortal sin a gambler could do. To welch on a bet is to not pay what you owe after losing. This act can be expected to be met with wrath from the parties scorned. So after Buster states that part of his plan involves me handing over the betting slip to him, it leaves me pondering if indeed Buster has been bitten by that insidious green snake of greed. For if I did this, it may not be welching, but it would certainly be welching by proxy and would forever tarnish my reputation in the world of the gambler. Not just that, but I'd be welching on an interdimensional soul mage, and thus, I'd have to expect a fierce and cruel retribution to be directed my way. But the simple fact is, I do trust Buster, and I'm not a gambler anymore. I'm an owner, I'm a rider. And with that, Buster suggests we take a little road trip, down south, towards the Del Mar racetrack. 62 miles, six motels, and 12 greasy palms later, we're let into the dark, dank room housing the catatonic jockey Hampton Motley. And there he is, just slumped over in his seat, switch in hand, playing round after round of jackbox. And all we hear is silence, periodically pierced by the game's sneers. Buster withdraws the betting slip which confines Motley's soul he hands it to me, and I tear it into fine pieces. I cross the room and I let the confetti fly. From out of nowhere, the phantom jockey materializes, strutting across the threadbare carpet and resuming its rightful place inside the vessel it calls home. Hampton sets down the switch, his eyes animated with life, and he yearns for vengeance for the days he's lost. Take me to Getty. I seek his skull. But Buster simmers him down, suggesting the best place for him, for all of us to settle our scores, is the only place it really matters, on the racetrack. Knowing we'll likely be facing heat from Getty and more directly a blowtorch from the Oracle, we need a spot to lay low till the next racing season starts. Buster suggests his sister, She's got a cozy little farm up north that she uses for breeding horses, he tells us. She would be able to house rigid mind and frugal power in her guest quarters, and the three of us could bunk in the barn. So here we are, a ragtag team of horsemen, all looking towards our next ride. We're not a busted trifecta, but rather a trifecta forged.